You raised hurt and humiliation. Mm. Um, how would that come up in a court proceeding in this case? So when you're looking at the damage that a person has experienced as a result of discrimination, there are a range of um, common factors that you look at. One of them's lost earnings um, and another might be, um, you know, that might be past and future earnings. They might have incurred medical expenses for um, psychological counselling. Um, and another component that's often compensated is hurt and humiliation or pain and suffering. And that really recognises the deep distress that people experience as a result of discrimination. Um, one of the things that the Australian Human Rights Commission survey uncovered is the significant adverse impact that discrimination has on women's mental health. Um, so two-thirds of respondents to that survey said that the discrimination had a negative impact on their mental health. and it's Can it come in the form of um, postnatal depression? Well, that would probably... I mean, I mean potentially it could exacerbate that. Um, that might be a separate psychological illness that the person's experiencing. Um, but this is something that's quite uh, distinct and attributable to discrimination, it's something we see in our clients, that severe loss in self-confidence that people experience after they've experienced discrimination in the workplace. If they've been demoted or dismissed, they suddenly really question um, their professional competence. Yeah, that's very interesting. We've, mm. we've gone from what is pregnancy discrimination to the court process. Um, when you're in the court process, do does the judge look at what avenues you've tried beforehand in making the decision? Not so much no. in my experience. It's not really one of the relevant considerations. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's any example where that would be relevant. And no, in my experience, I've, I've not seen that, and it, it shouldn't be. The only issue that might arise potentially is a question which would arise right at the end of the proceeding, or possibly earlier, if there was an application for a cost order and there may be some consideration then as to whether or not an offer of settlement was considered and whether that was reasonable to reject any such offer. For our viewers, can you explain a cost order? Yes. Um, under the Fair Work Act, the general position is that both parties bear their own costs. And what I mean by that is that any costs that a party to a proceeding would incur generally by way of legal expenses would be a cost that they have to bear at the end of the proceeding, regardless of, of who was successful or not. That's a position that generally is not disturbed by the court. Um, there are some exceptions, though, and, and one of those uh, envisages a situation where somebody has acted unreasonably, perhaps in the pursuit of an application or in their defence of an application, and it's in that situation where the court might have regard to an offer of settlement, for example, that was made, and whether or not it was reasonable for a party to um, refuse to accept such an offer. So that's really the only scenario I can think of where something you had done not directly in relation to the proceeding might be relevant, but there may be some other examples that people have. So but you can try all, nearly all the avenues to try and resolve your situation. Yes, there are some limitations, and Melanie might be able to explain that in terms of um, in some circumstances there's a need to go to the Fair Work Commission, for mm. example, and to obtain a certificate. Melanie might want to explain how that operates. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right, and there are a range of um, options at the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission uh, and the Australian Human Rights Commission, and, and sometimes you have to go there before you can proceed to the next stage at um, the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal or the relevant court. Uh, and by and large, most claims do settle at that point or in no negotiations before the court case. Um, so that's another thing to bear in mind when you're considering your evidence. You don't necessarily have to prove your case in a court to get a favourable outcome. You might negotiate an outcome um, somewhere along the way before you get to that point. Uh, I was also um, thinking your question brought to mind the situation. So while the court wouldn't necessarily take into account the negotiations, um, leading up to the court proceeding, they often do look at uh, the kind of deterioration of the employment relationship uh, at, at the very end. And um, one thing that often happens is that uh, the employee will say that they were forced to resign because the treatment in the end became so bad. 
um, that they felt they had no other choice. And in those cases, the court will look very carefully at um, what was said between the employer and the employee and whether that was truly the case. So then they really do examine a lot of those those conversations. So, Paul, do you have anything to add to that? I just what Melanie was talking about was a concept called constructive dismissal, where um, normally what happens is that for a person to lodge an unfair dismissal claim, the termination has to be at the initiative of the employer. So it has to be the employer has sacked the employee. But with constructive dismissal, it's an exception in the sense that what the employer do did was so bad or their conduct be towards the employee was so bad that it really, in effect, forced the employee to resign. Mm. Right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But uh, before we go, I'd just like to get your final thoughts on this area of law. So, Catherine, do you have any final thoughts? I, I think it's a fascinating area and I think it's one that impacts on so many people and so many organisations. So, from my perspective, it's about understanding and communicating the issue so that as many people are aware of it as possible. And Paul, what kind of lessons do you think employers can take away from this? Um, employers can take lessons away that when, when, when somebody is pregnant at work they really need to give some sort of be careful and they need to give some serious consideration to how they present and how they speak to the employee and what they speak to them about and really good record keeping is always, always really vital. And Melanie, your final thoughts? Um, I agree that information is really important. Everyone, employers and employees, should be well aware of their legal obligations. So get on the internet, look at the Victoria Legal Aid website, look at the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission websites and find out what your rights and obligations are. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. You've been very insightful um, and we look forward to having you on again in the future. Um, so Melanie, thank you. Thank Paul you. and Catherine. Thanks. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. To catch up on all our past episodes, you can go to our YouTube channel or visit our website www.lawhelpaustralia.org. Thanks for watching.